What specific goals or priorities should the BRICS bloc set to ensure a successful alternative to the current, let's say, current world order? What are, uh, of course, the priorities? Well, look, the key priority which we uh, also highlighted as part of our team is to strengthen the partnership with Africa uh, using the Continental Free Trade Agreement as a template for greater interaction between BRICS countries and the African continent for mutual benefit. Looking at the system, as you would have seen, the issue of uh, currency was a major, major focus area during the summit, and it uh, garnered a great deal of global attention. Uh, there was a lot of talk about de-dollarization, but this was not on the BRICS agenda. As you would see in the Johannesburg II Declaration, uh, paragraph 45 specifically speaks to the issue of currency. And what the BRICS leaders did, they had a very robust discussion amongst themselves. And following that discussions, they have tasked the finance ministers and or central bank uh, governors to look into the question of, of the question of currency and payment instruments and platform platforms and to report to the next summit in Russia next year. But you would see that there is a, a accelerated move among BRICS countries and even beyond BRICS of countries from the global south, Africa included, to deepen interaction amongst themselves using local currencies, creating your own payment systems. As I've indicated, even the African Union has taken a decision that in order to advance the continental free trade agreement, uh, we need to trade in our uh, own national currencies rather than trading in foreign currencies. And this will save Africa at least $5 billion annually in terms of uh, transaction costs. Uh, we are setting up our own payment settlement system, the Pan-African uh, payment settlement system that has been set up by the Afriexim Bank and a number of, of commercial banks and central banks have already subscribed to this instrument. India is bringing the same. Uh, China and Russia uh, have set up their own payment system, uh, giving countries greater flexibility, financial flexibility, and choices in terms of how they conduct the global trade interactions uh, within the continent, amongst countries of the global south, and internationally. And I think this uh, is one of the key areas that BRICS has been a catalyst. And as I said, it spread well beyond BRICS countries now. A large number of countries from the global south are looking at trading directly amongst themselves in, in the national currencies. So this is, a, I think, a very important area uh, coming out of the Johannesburg summit. Another very important area was the what we refer to as inclusive multilateralism in our theme, that the multilateral system is, is today uh, in a semi-paralyzed uh, situation. The United Nations Security Council, whose chief mandate it is to address global peace and security, is almost absent from the Russia-Ukraine conflict because it's a paralyzed body uh, divided amongst the, the China and, uh, and, and Russia on one side and the UK, France and uh, USA on the other side. So it's a very divided house and so are many of the other multilateral institutions. That's why there is this call that institutions that were created post Second World War, like your Bretton Woods institutions, like your United Nations system, they are including the World Trade Organization and your financial uh, uh, Bretton Woods system, all have to be reformed, reflecting the new reality of a global South that continues to rise and occupies a major place in terms of the global economic and financial architecture. The global trading architecture is no more unipolar. It's not dominated by the USA or, or Europe. Countries from the global south are bigger players today on the global trading front. Uh, China is the largest trading partner globally today. It's no longer the USA. So the dynamics have changed, and this is what was addressed in Johannesburg, that we want real reform of these organizations to reflect the reality and that is what we are pushing for and will continue to champion on the global front
How do the new member countries fit into the Brits' uh, uh, political and economic uh, aims, and how is their going, or how can their inclusion contribute to the achievement of these goals? We're looking at uh, the new countries uh, into the overall economic and political aims of the Brits bloc, and how would the inclusion uh, contribute to the achievement of these goals? Well, as, as I've indicated, all of these countries wrote to become full members of the BRICS family through their own volition. It was their decision to say that they want to become a full member. Obviously, they have been observing what BRICS has been doing over these past 15 years that we have been meeting in summit form and the cooperation that we have cemented amongst ourselves. And they felt that they can add value to the BRICS family, but equally important that being part of BRICS gives them a greater, greater opportunities and also to champion the issues that we have been championing. They all identify with the core values and principles that BRICS has been championing since the very first summit in 2009. And that is why they, they chose to become full members of BRICS. So I think bringing them on board amplifies not just the voice, but amplifies the strength of BRICS in championing all of these key issues that I have alluded to on the global geopolitical security front, the economic front, as well as the financial front, because these are countries uh, that are quite weighty in their own right and have strengths, each one of them have different strengths, which will contribute to further uh, fortifying and enhancing the cooperation we have. Now, these new members will be on the same status as the existing five members. There will be no differentiation. They will be part of all the meetings, all of the working groups, all of the ministerial tracks, all of the expert groups, and they, could, they can also subscribe to uh, the pre-existing agreements that we have signed up to now, and they will be incorporated into these uh, structures. <clears throat> they will be most of them now are already asking to become a member of the new development bank as shareholders. Egypt is already <clears throat> a shareholder. Uh, all of the other UAE is already an existing shareholder in the NDB. And all of the new members are all applying to become shareholders in the NDB. So that also gives them access to, to finance through the NDB for their own development uh, program. So this is also another value add to that these countries will benefit from uh, as being part of the BRICS family.